Hello hackers! Welcome to Pwn College. I'm Jan and today we're going to be talking about interacting with programs. This module is all about uh, interacting with programs, sending them input in various ways through various channels, uh, controlling the environment they run in, etc, etc. And this video is going to be a crash course in information that I hope will be a review uh, to remind you how the command line works and how programs are invoked and uh, etc. All right, let's dive in. So you've hopefully all ran at some point in your lives a hello world program from the Linux command line. You do dot slash hello world, prints out hello world and exit. So what happens under the hood when you do that? Well, um, Linux does a bunch of stuff. It facilitates the uh, launching of your program, which we'll learn about in uh, future videos. It um, figures out how to properly um, mediate interaction between the process that your program creates and uh, the environment it runs in, um, and so on. Uh, Linux is relevant because this is what we're using for this class. Uh, it's probably the most popular uh, operating system in the world when you factor in the routers it runs in, the uh, uh, Android phones, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that it powers. So, um, in this class, we'll use Linux to explore these various cybersecurity concepts, and your main interaction with Linux will be the command line. So, we're going to do a quick command line crash uh, uh, refresher. All right. What is the command line? Well, the command line, also known as a shell, it's a powerful interface to use a computer. Generally, you type in commands and the shell uh, executes those commands and shows you results. A uh, typical command contains either a built-in functionality of the shell and or a program name, a program that exists on your computer, and then arguments to that program. Separated by spaces here, I do a cat flag um, what happens is the shell sees, okay, I want to run the cat program with a flag argument. It invokes the cat program. The process that results from that invocation, uh, hold on a second, let me fix this slide. One sec. There we go. I had uh, slashes where there shouldn't have been slashes. Sorry about that. All right. What happens is the process that results from the invocation of cat flag reads its first argument, which is flag, opens that file and prints it to standard output, to the output of the terminal. Uh, that's what CAD is designed to do. It uh, reads out files. So how um, would you know what CAD is supposed to do if you had never run CAD before? Um, well, you should really know what CAD does. That's a very basic thing. If you don't, um, there's a number of ways to get familiar. One is you can uh, run through a war game called Bandit that uh, familiarizes you uh, forcefully with the command line and some other concepts. Uh, you can search online for tutorials or really what you should be doing is using the awesome documentation that comes on Linux systems. The man pages, you can do man cat, uh, you get this very helpful uh, help output about cat. Um, for shell built-ins, I mentioned this several times, um, for example, cd to change directories, you can do help cd um, to read about what they do. Or if you really get stumped, ask, ask us on the Pwn College Discord. We're always happy to help um, to an extent. Uh, this is something that you should know before tackling the course in general. All right. So I mentioned uh, processes. We're going to skim over this real quick because it will be the subject of future videos in this module. A process is a running program. And a program really is a file on your computer, right? Cat exists somewhere in an executable file on my computer. We'll talk about that in a sec. Um, and these executable files live in a file system. So your web browser, every file on your computer lives in a file system. Um, and we'll cover the executables themselves in depth in, in, in a bit in future videos. For now, let's talk about the file system, which is where files live, right? Um, 
you might have experience with Windows. Uh, most people do. In Windows, you have a C drive. If you have additional drives or back in the day when we had CD-ROM drives, you might have a D drive, an E drive, et cetera, et cetera. You plug in a flash drive, it, it becomes an F drive, whatever. Uh, if you ever interacted with a floppy disk, the, that's where A and B were from. Anyways, um, Windows has all of these file systems uh, separated out, anchored in, in to, to different letters. Linux is not like that. Linux presents a unified file system view. It is anchored at slash, also pronounced root, the root of the file system tree. Uh, that's a little bit of a confusing uh, nomenclature because root is used for some other concepts, but let's, uh, I mean, there's no way around it. Uh, it's anchored at slash or root otherwise known. Um, and there's a bunch of directories and in a crazy tree under that, right? Here's some common ones on the slides. For example, uh, slash user, that's how everyone pronounces it, but it's not actually user, it stands for Unix system resource. That's where your Unix systems resources are stored um, and contains like, uh, well, I, I say all on the slide, but not all, it contains many, many, many system files such as executable files in user bin. If you look on your system right now, uh, spoiler alert, that's where cat lives. Um, it has uh, uh, libraries in user lib, uh, shared uh, program resources in user share, uh, slash etc has your system configuration, slash var has logs and caches for the system, uh, slash home, is where all your data is, specifically in the um, Pwn College infrastructure and slash home slash CTF is your persistent home directory. Um, slash proc, you can go and look around and it has information about processes, about uh, system configurations, a lot of good stuff in slash proc, very interesting to dig around in, and slash temp for temporary data storage and much, 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 much more. Uh, this is kind of the convention. Uh, there's actually a Linux standard uh, called the Linux standards base that, that uh, specifies what um, directories are, really have to be there in a typical Linux system. But uh, Linux is actually very, very, very configurable. You could create a Linux distribution and there are Linux distributions that, that have a completely different file system layout for example. Um, but this is kind of your typical organization of a Linux file system. Um, and uh, all of the things I just named off, all of those files are directories, right? Directories hold files. Files are stored in directories. This sh should really hopefully be very much review. Um, what is interesting is each process runs in some sense in a directory. Each process has a sense of what is my current working directory, right? The directory where by default, I'll start looking for files, stuff like that. Um, your shell is just a process, your command interpreter, and it has an understanding of its current working directory. And you can actually view what the current working directory is with the PWD built in print working directory. Um, it also usually shows in your prompt like here, uh, I start out current working directories, this tilde, that's a shorthand for I am in my home directory, for example, slash home slash yans, as you can see from executing PWD. Um, you can list the files in the directory with ls. So here's files in my home directory. And I can move to another directory, change my current working directory with the CD built in with uh, and when I do CD slash user, my current working directory becomes slash user, I can list that. I can go into this previous directory I'd seen in my home directory, home yans flags. I can see that. I can see that there's a top secret file and I can cat out that top secret file. Pretty cool, right? Directories, hold files and other directories. All right, um, let's talk about paths for a sec. In that previous um, example, I was, uh, I did, cat slash home slash yon slash flags, but that's very tedious. If, if you always have to start from slash, uh, directories get pretty deep, especially in a complex uh, system, uh, you know, if, especially if you're doing software development, uh, when you have modules and submodules and all of them are, you know, all the source codes in different directories and subdirectories, it's a nightmare to always type what is called an absolute path, a path that starts with slash 
a path that refers to the very beginning of the file system tree. Um, you don't want to do that, and that's why we invented relative paths. Uh, relative paths don't start with a slash, and they are relative to the current working directory. So that previous concept talked about every process has current working directory, where that's really used is when the process tries to access a relative path, that relative path starts from that current working directory. Here, uh, my current working directory in home yawns, I try to cat top secret. There's no top secret file in home yawns, it's in home yawns flags. If I cd into flags and then cat top secret, then it comes out, all right? So, uh, um, these paths don't, uh, the paths that do start with slash again are absolute paths. These other three paths that don't start with slash are relative paths relative to the current working directory. Let's take a closer look at paths, right? So specifically, there are several different components of a path, possible components. First, you might have that leading forward slash that creates an absolute path. Then you have a bunch of directory names. We just kind of assumed that this was obvious slash home. That is the home directory slash yawns, the yawns directory slash. So every time I put a slash after a directory, I signify, hey, let's look inside that directory, right? We're referencing some resource inside the directory. There's also a dot that can be in the path. A dot is a, um, a special entry in a directory that, that basically signifies itself. Uh, and I'll explain why that is uh, important in a second. Uh, but basically you can do dot slash blah, 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 blah. And it's still your current directory slash something. Um, you can do dot at any point inside the path. <clears throat> or you can do a dot dot. That means step back, step up the tree or closer to the uh, anchor, the root of the tree, uh, step into the directory that contains my directory, right? And then of course, at the end of the path, you have a file name, uh, often your final destination. So these are different ways to um, access the same file. If we start out in slash user slash bin, we can uh, uh, reference this top secret file using its full path. We can do a relative uh, walk basically a relative path from user bin to dot dot slash dot dot slash home because this two dot dot slashes gets us into slash right the first dot dot uh, slash puts us into or puts us references slash user the second dot dot slash references slash and then we have home yawns flags top secret all right and then uh, this all uh, is also referencing the same uh, file and so look at uh, this very interesting thing where I started out referencing the current directory, but because I did dot, dot, slash, et cetera, et cetera, I ended up way back up all the way back to root and then into home, yawns, et cetera. This is actually the source of uh, a uh, vulnerability class known as path traversal. Uh, oftentimes in an in a application that is not careful, it's possible to sneak in these uh, dot dot slashes, et cetera, to get at files that the application doesn't want you to get at. But that's uh, looking way ahead and not actually something that we'll dig into in this course, but is a interesting security thing to know. Um, all right, so this is the anatomy of a path. Um, now, we did cat some path, but, but where is cat itself, right? Is cat a relative path? To a program? If if so, when we did cat flag slash top secret, we would expect that there is a cat file in the current directory, but you can see there is not. And if you try to cat it out, it doesn't exist. Right? It turns out that if the first word of a command has no forward slash characters, now of course you could do dot slash cat and try to execute a cat file in the local directory, you can give an absolute path, but if the first word of the command has no forward slash characters, the shell will search for that program. Um, or either it'll search its built-ins, uh, stuff like CD uh, and so on, uh, built-in functionality programmed into the shell interpreter itself, or it'll search its file system 
in, through a set of directories specified in the path variable for that program. So what, what, what the heck is a path variable? Well, what's a variable in general? Um, here we, we, I'm referring to environment variables, a concept in Linux and uh, most operating systems actually, um, where basically every process will start with some information handed to it. We'll talk later about how that information gets there, where it's stored in future videos. But for now, consider that every process starts with a set of key value pairs when it's launched um, that, uh, hold on a second. Let me pause and fix something. I'm back, sorry about that. I don't know how this uh, screenshot disappeared, but it disappeared. All right, it's back now. So um, you can print out the environment variables uh, that, that you currently are passing around. Programs pass these environment variables, processes pass these environment variables to each other as they uh, execute each other. So your shell will pass them on to um, your any commands you execute. Uh, you can uh, check the environment variables you're currently logging around with the env command. It's a very useful command and you should study its man page, especially for this module. Um, but you can use env to look at the environment variables that are set. So in this screenshot, I have a bunch of environment variables set. And then of course you can update your environment variables by uh, using some shell syntax, for example, or through other APIs. Um, if you're not in a shell, for example, you're writing a program. Um, and now my environment variables are different. So I can actually for example, change the path environment variable to make it search for cat in a different place. All right, um, back to uh, uh, paths, right? If you're um, curious about where uh, a your shell will actually find a given program, what actual uh, binary will end up being executed, you can use the which command, which searches through your path and returns the, the um, searches through your path environment variable and returns the file system path uh, of the command wherever it finds it. Cool. Um, all right. Let's look deeper at files themselves. We've been talking a lot about files, 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 this and that. Um, but we haven't really dug into what a file is, right? It turns out there are many different types of files. Uh, the uh, regular concept of a file that you're used to, the, 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 the flag file you've been catting out in all of these examples that has data, that's just one type of file. It's the most common one. It's the normal, regular file. Um, you can use um, the ls-ld command to look at your files. Really, it's ls-l is what gives this long form output of details about files. Dash D allows you to also look at directories. Normally LS will look inside directories with dash D it'll instead look at the directory. All right, so LS dash LD, if we look at the um, top secret file that actually has our flag in it that we've been catting out in these screenshots, you can see it's it the type of the file, the first character printed on the line is a dash. If you look at the directory containing it, that is a D. Of course, D stands for directory. Directory is actually a type of file uh, that just happens to have entries that refer to other files. Um, again, a dash is just a regular file. There are a lot of other files. There are symbolic links. We'll talk about them in uh, uh, next. There are named pipes, we'll talk about them a little later. And then there's exotic stuff like uh, character device file. These are files that represent a hardware device, usually a hardware device, so, but any sort of um, um, device backed by the operating system itself, uh, which of course mediates communication with hardware as well, um, that uh, streams data, such as a microphone, right? Uh, a block device is a device that loads and stores uh, chunks of data, like a hard drive. Um, and uh, then there's S, which is an exotic uh, device that's a way to do networking in, in Unix without actual network addresses through these files. We won't worry about that really in this class. But um, as a fun fact, much of the 
infrastructure of Pwn College depends on these crazy Unix sockets and the ability to communicate through them. All right. So these are our uh, different types of files. Let's look at symbolic links. Um, a symbolic link is also known as a soft link. It's, a, it's basically a type of file that references another file. It's like a forwarding address. You try to open a symbolic link and says, no, no, not me, not me. I, I'm actually pointing to this other file, right? You create them with uh, the LN command for links, link with the dash S symbolic argument. Read the man page of LN. It's, it's very useful. There's a lot of good stuff. Um, and you can create a, a file. So here we're creating this symbolic link link to the flag. This is a symbolic link file. You can see this L that points to when we, when we do ls dash L on the current directory points to flag slash top secret, right? This relative path. Um, and then when we cat out this file, what we're actually catting out is its destination, right? It's, it's the file it's referencing. Uh, you can also link directories same way you uh, uh, just make a link you can look we can look at it and it points to flags and we can we can cut out the that linked directory slash top secret and we get our flag all right uh, links are super useful they're they're useful for uh, many reasons uh, and, and that they're so useful that I'm, I'm drawing a blank on an example but if you're um, setting up a um, I don't know, development file system and you want to link in different repositories, A, you're probably doing it wrong, but B, uh, you can use symbolic links for that and many other things. All right, some symbolic link gotchas. Um, a crazy behavior of symbolic links is if you have a symbolic link pointing to a relative path, that relative path is relative to the symbolic link itself, not to your current directory, right? So here I create a symbolic link in slash home slash yans that is pointing to flag slash top secret. But if I move that symbolic link somewhere to slash temp, and then I try to cut it out, what it's actually trying to get at is slash temp slash flags slash top secret, even though my current directory is still in my home directory. And of course, it can't find that file. But rather than print uh, by default, cat tries to open that file and just gets an error that that file doesn't exist. It doesn't investigate where it's pointing to, et cetera, et cetera. It just tells you that this link uh, does not exist, which is very confusing because that link very much exists because it's right here. It's just its destination doesn't exist. So be careful about uh, relative paths and this sort of error opacity where, where you will see errors about the symbolic link but uh, they're really about the destination of the symbolic link. Um, of course, if you just stick to absolute paths, things tend to work much better, but then uh, you might actually, th this might not be the desired behavior. For example, if you just rename slash home slash yans to slash home slash blah, this would still work with this relative path, but absolute path would then not work, right? So it depends on your use case. There are some gotchas. All right. So uh, the existence of soft links implies the existence of hard links, right? And the, they do exist. They are created with LN without the dash s argument. And they are a perfect reference to the original file, to the data pointed to by the original file in the same way that the original file is. Actually, uh, you could view any normal file as a hard link to the contents and creating a hard link just adds another one, right? Um, in this case, when I link hard link to flag to point to flag slash top secret, that is an ident or that is a, 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 a file that is very hard to tell that it is not the original file, right? It, it, they share the same content if I modify one um, the other one will change, et cetera, et cetera. Soft links are, are that same way, but, but hard links, uh, that hard link has no relationship with the original path of the original file, just with the data, uh, unlike a soft link. Um, if you are really interested in how this works, right? Um, I'm not going to go into inodes, what they are and et cetera, et cetera, in this lecture, but if you're interested in how this works, 
you can uh, dig into this post and uh, get a lot of information. All right, um, let's move on to pipes. Pipes are another type of file, um, a, a P file. It represents a named pipe, but most pipes on your uh, computer uh, when you're using Linux are actually not named. They are ephemeral channels of uh, unidirectional uh, information where one side of the pipe writes to it and the other side reads to it. Um, this is an example. If I cat out the flag and I try to compute the MD5 sum of it, I can cat the flag out, I can pipe it, I can MD5 sum. Uh, that's that input. Um, so this flows input into MD5 sum. In the same way, I can flow input into a uh, shell script or into a shell. Let me show you, let's see if this will work. Let me show you how this will go. Um, all right, this kind of works. Uh, I can do echo, echo high, right? So this will output echo high. If I pipe that into a bash shell, it'll actually execute it because bash is my shell interpreter that reads uh, commands from from its input, which I am now making uh, as its input, this echo, the output of echo, echo high, which is echo high. All right, crazy stuff. You'll have to uh, get very familiar with it in this uh, module, but um, that was a sneak peek. Named pipes, um, also known as FIFOs, uh, for their behavior of the first, it's called first in, first out. So the first data that's received is the first data that's output. Later data goes next and so on. Um, they are a file that exists on the file system that uh, acts the same as a uh, pipe. It's a unidirectional uh, information uh, uh, channel for information flow. And you will have to get familiar with those as well and with the mk 5 command, read the man page. All right. Um, let's talk about input and output redirection. I, I very casually redirected um, uh, output from one command into the input of another command with a pipe, but you can also redirect files. Um, and the syntax to do so is just tacking on basically a less than for redirecting to the input or a greater than for redirecting output. Um, to the command itself, right? I can uh, redirect the input uh, from a different file. I can redirect the output into a file. I can append the output to a file. I can redirect errors printed by the program. Of course, the program has to be careful, properly print these errors and so forth, but I can redirect errors written to a program with this uh, two greater than uh, syntax. You will have to understand um, and you might have to look up documentation and, 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 and find why that two greater than is a two greater than uh, in the course of this module. Um, and this allows you basically to redirect uh, input and output in and out of your program, um, which is super important for scripting, automating, and, and, and et cetera. All right, that is the crash course that I have for you about uh, the command line. If this was a lot of new information, I highly recommend that. Poor cat. I, I highly recommend that you um, look online for resources to get up to speed with using the command line. Um, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of tutorials all over the place on YouTube, uh, documentation uh, through text, uh, challenge uh, series, etc., etc., etc on getting very familiar with the command line. You will need it for this module and you will need it for the rest of the class. And that is why this module exists. All right, and then at the, the, through the rest of the module, we'll talk about how programs work in Linux, uh, how they start up, how they interact with their environment, how they shut down. That as well will help you out in your quest to get the top of the scoreboard. Good luck.